Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this, the 18th meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2014. Could I ask everyone, please, to make sure that the mobile phones and other electronic devices are silent or switched to airplane mode? Uh, Linda Fabiani has sent her apologies today as she's busy with work related to the Smith Commission. So, again, we welcome to her, uh, his place, Kenneth Gibson. Um, we go to agenda item two. Uh, is a decision on whether to take item four in private. Item four, consideration of the evidence received on the draft budget. Do members agree? Okay. And that brings us to agenda item three, which is an evidence session on the draft budget 2015-16. And I'd like to welcome this morning to the committee uh, Carla McCormick, Policy and Parliamentary Officer at Poverty Alliance, Morag Johnson, Assistant Director of Financial Services at Glasgow City Council, Cliff Dryborough, Benefits Manager, City of Edinburgh Council, Brian Cook, Head of Revenue Services at North Lanarkshire Council, Jeremy Hewer, Policy Advisor, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, Keith Dryborough, Policy Manager, Citizens Advice Scotland, Marianne McManus, Divisional Housing Manager at North Ayrshire Council and also Alacho, and Jonathan Sharma, Policy Manager at COSLA. Um, the, the format here this morning is a round table, and the idea is that we try, rather than have a formal uh, question and answer, that people can pick up points and run with them, uh, challenge uh, information that's presented. Members of the committee will get a chance to make observations or ask questions, but we should try and keep it as fluid as, as possible and try and examine as many areas as possible. Um, I'll start the ball rolling just by th uh, throwing something out and I'm uh, going to come to Keith Dreiber first. Um, I possibly could have come to Marianne McManus, but it's on the basis of the, the paper that Alacho gave us. Uh, because at point 23 in their document, it said that for several councils, the issue of bedroom tax legacy arrears remains a problem. Now, I'd like to hear uh, the, the association expand on that, but I just thought I would come to Keith first to, to ask from your point of view, do you concur with that and to what extent are we talking about this legacy being a problem? Uh, from our perspective, uh, I think just to say first that the, 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 the funding given to, on DHP by the Scottish Government has been successful and local authorities have done very well in, in mitigating the impact of the bedroom tax based on that funding. Uh, looking at our stats, we saw uh, a 25% increase in health and benefit cases last year and a knock-on impact on social rent arrears, which up, went up 33%. Uh, so rent arrears are at the highest level they've been since the recession at Citizens Advice Bureau. Um, but obviously we, homelessness uh, and eviction rates are, are broadly stable. So I, I'd say that um, on the whole, local authorities and, and um, RSL housing providers that have done well in, in mitigating the impact of, bed, of the bedroom tax, though this does remain an issue in what you do about clients who have DHP, but they still have that rent arrears behind them, whether they're able to repay there or not, and what the next steps will be. Okay. Marianne, obviously the, your paper has instigated the question, so you've heard from someone who's taken an overview of, of the, the, the situation from those who are coming to them, but from your perspective, why, why that... Um, Information. No. Yes, obviously it was welcome the um, funding that we received from the Scottish Government to mitigate fully um, in 1415, and obviously the um, position for 1516 going forward. Um, but the funding that was available to local authorities in 1314 didn't fully mitigate um, the the charges on tenants at that time, and that is why that there are a number of people who haven't received discretionary housing payments to cover that period. Um, which is resulting in, you know, the legacy arrears for that period. Okay. For other local authorities, I mean, individual circumstances, is there something per peculiar to, to your uh, situation, Brian? Uh, our authority, we've got just over 1,100 cases where they've got legacy arrears arising from 13, 14, uh, and that's about 470, 475 grand uh, due to us. Uh, a number of them, uh, and even as we find this year, uh, are because of non-engagement. Uh, we've made offers of help with DHP, uh, but there are still, uh, even last year, uh, where we could help, uh, we couldn't help uh, obviate all the, the losses they'd experienced. Uh, we were making partial contributions of DHP for uh, the amounts they were losing, uh, and they've just been unable to make that money back up. Okay. 
Is that the same for other councils? Um, certainly for Edinburgh, the experience is very similar to North Lanarkshire for 13-14. Uh, for 14-15, we have very, very few claimants left now that haven't engaged. Um, you know, it, it, it has been a bit laborious. Letters, door knocking, etc. But we're, we're pretty much there for 14-15. But there are legacy areas for 13-14. Uh, we weren't able to fully fund that year. Obviously, from Glasgow City Council's perspective, we have to engage with uh, over 60 registered social landlords. We don't have our own housing stock. Um, and certainly, again, for 1415, I think we've almost processed um, all of the uh, applications required for the bedroom tax in 1415. But we have had a lot of inquiries and engagement from RSLs asking about the uh, previous years. But again, a similar situation. The DHP fund can't go back. Jeremy, from your perspective, is there a particular issue or is it similar to, to what you hear from the local authorities? I think there is an issue, certainly. Um, obviously, uh, in thirteen fourteen, because um, the situation changed during the course of the financial year with uh, additional funding being made available, uh, I think, in September, October time, which enabled local authorities to perhaps be... Um, more liberal in their interpretation of who needed um, discretionary housing payments. That obviously did make a, uh, a big difference, but I think toward the end of the financial year, there were some authorities that had not actually spent their full allocation, and it was, our hope was that, that, that perhaps they could, uh, those that actually had perhaps some money still in the pot might be able to, to look at back cases, but I, in terms of um, the support that we did get from local authorities, um, you know, it, it, it was by and large very positive. And certainly during, during that financial year, um, cases that perhaps had, had not been successful in getting DHBs when more funding became available, the um, local authorities proactively got in contact and said we could now actually support these people. Okay. Before coming to you, Alec, I just wanted to give Carla the opportunity, even from the Poverty Alliance's point of view, those affected by the rears, how big an issue is that? Um, still outstanding. To be honest with you, it's not something that we have heard a great deal about. Um, there would generally be more CAS or housing associations that would hear directly on that. So okay, we don't fine. have much to add, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, thank you, convener. When we spoke to the Cabinet Secretary, uh, I asked about the issue of uh, arrears coming from 13-14. Uh, uh, and she made it clear that the level of funding that had been with, avail, made available to the DHP uh, was in excess of that that was required uh, to deal with uh, issues of the under-occupancy charge in the current year, and that it was within the discretion of local authorities to use any surplus to look at arrears from previous years. Now, what I'd like to ask is, uh, is anybody aware of a local authority that is currently doing that, using that uh, surplus in the DH uh, uh, discretionary housing fund to look at previous years' arrears? And more importantly, perhaps, uh, is there evidence of uh, local authorities who might wish to do that but simply don't have the flexibility or resources to achieve that? Um, at North East Council, certainly for... Um 1415, the, the, the allotted um, money we received will only fund the number of cases we have for 1415, so we don't have any surplus that we can use to back date for, for 1314. Um, but obviously, if there was funding available for that, we, we could look to do that. Yeah, the, I think the fund that we've been notified that we'll get through the course of the year, uh, both from the DWP and from the uh, distribution from the Scottish Government, uh, I think was predicated on the 1415 case in values, uh, and I don't expect to have uh, anything surplus there, unfortunately, to go back the way. Mm. Yep, so. uh, exactly the same for the City of Edinburgh. In fact, if anything, we're going to be slightly overspent uh, in 1415 because I think the estimates of the under occupancy levels were difficult to determine ex you know, accurately. So we've got a slight overspend in 14-15 projected. So having looked backwards, there's still <coughs> issues. But Jonathan Sharma from uh, Cosler, you, you indicated that looking forward, there might be a potential problem uh, if the UK government doesn't commit to 
the money is going forward for DHP? You think there's a, an issue pending, or is that a fear that you have with some substance? Um, well, we have um, the 30, 35 million confirmed from the Scottish Government for as far as the Scottish draft budget is concerned. Um, so that, that um, is, is in place. Um, we just need to see what happens with the D, DWP. Um, our feeling is that, um, you know, th there's nothing that's come forward to suggest that th there would be anything different from the assumptions that the Scottish Government has made around uh, what the D DWP will provide. Um, so we just need to, to see, see what that um, <coughs> will come out with. <coughs> I, I suppose the more general point is that we have an agreement with the Scottish Government um, to look at um, the actual experience uh, for each of the local authorities in terms of mitigating the, the bedroom tax. Um, and we will be doing that um, uh, come uh, May uh, time next year um, when uh, there are official um, uh, statistics available about the amount of um, bedroom tax um, liability in, in, in each authority and uh, the extent to which that's been uh, mitigated by, by the councils, whether that gives us an opportunity to um, talk about um, things like the 13-14 the arrears. Um, you know, I, th I, th I think that's still a little bit open there. Um, I think we, we are guided by our members as to um, just ex exactly how much of an issue uh, that is, and um, certainly we can um, take these kind of arguments back um, uh, to the Scottish Government um, nearer, nearer the time uh, in terms of um, finalising uh, the 14-15 position. Okay. More? If I could just come in on, on, that, on that point regarding 15-16, I think from uh, Glasgow's perspective, we, we do have some concern about the 15-16 allocation, but not necessarily with regard to the Scottish Government. It's the DWP, and, and Glasgow has a history of um, awarding DHPs, you know, prior to all these welfare reform changes, regularly, maybe over a million pounds a year. Uh, certainly, our understanding of the allocation last year was there was a risk that that could have been significantly impacted. Um, significantly reduced. Fortunately, it wasn't. But we are concerned that that might be the case in 1516. And the implications are that it's it's the other tenancies that are affected. It's the private landlord households then that are impacted as a result of that. So I think that is that is a risk. Okay, Carla. Um, I just want to comment on that as well. We've had quite a few people raise with us that they're concerned that the discretionary housing payments are being used almost solely to mitigate against the bedroom tax and currently there are other exceptional circumstances increasing like with sanctions um, and the benefit cap particularly people these people are going to find themselves as well also relying on discretionary housing payments and if all that is used for the bedroom tax then we have to think about how we fund these other cases as well that's an issue that's come up before Keith uh, from Gaz yeah, I was about to say pretty much the same thing. Uh, DHP was never set up just for the bedroom tax. It's just become the funding route for the bedroom tax. Uh, so it's important that those who lost out under previous reforms don't, don't lose out as a result of this. And uh, possible future reforms to housing benefit for, say, under 25s, it could, again, be the funding route to help those, um, those kinds of clients. So it's important that we realise that there is additional pressures, not just the bedroom tax on the DHP funding. Uh, before I come to uh, the Deputy Convener to ask a question, can I ask uh, whoever it is in the public gallery whose uh, electronic device is, is clearly operating um, because it, it affects the recording, so could you please put it on silent or on airplane mode because we can hear it here? Okay, Jamie. Thank you, uh, Convener. And, uh, it's, uh, just go through a number of the... Uh, the written submissions that we've received in advance of today's session, starting with the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations. <laughs> when I, I, at your uh, conclusion, uh, you say that given the resources at its disposal and the limits to intervention imposed upon it under the current devolution settlement, the Scottish Government has managed to mitigate many of the negative aspects of welfare reform. And uh, North Lancashire Council specifically say uh, about discretionary 
Uh, housing payments, uh, the, the government's intention to negate the impact of the bedroom tax has been successfully achieved. Um, and uh, Edinburgh Council suggests that the level of funding they have through the Scottish Welfare Fund it currently meets local needs. Just obviously anyone can comment on that, but specifically the organisations I mentioned. I mean, I suppose it begets a question, do you think the Scottish Government is doing a pretty good job in terms of trying to mitigate the effects of welfare fund with its limited resources and with its limited competences in this uh, area? <coughs> yeah, Jeremy. Um, with the resources that are being allocated, I would say that um, our members are um, very appreciative of the um, intervention that's been made by the Scottish Government and indeed uh, speaking to colleagues south of the border, I think they cast envious glances at things like uh, the full mitigation of the discretionary housing payment and the council tax reduction in particular. And obviously the, south of the border they have very great worries about the local welfare arrangements uh, that are replacing the social fund. Okay. Right. In terms of the, the DHP, uh, where we said it's been, you know, the government's intentions been met, uh, we're contrasting obviously in uh, the current year, 1415, uh, we've made awards of about £2.6 million pounds for DHP uh, against bedroom tax, and in the previous year that was only about £1.3 million, and the £2.6 million plus in the UK at the end of the year, uh, we will exhaust the, uh, the deductions that we've had for uh, the spare room subsidy. Uh, so, from that perspective, I think, yes, uh, the resources have been made available to us through the Scottish Government and uh, have affected the 14-15 year uh, and just about, uh, similar to uh, Cliff's comments, uh, we've just about got everybody. We're down to probably the last 100 or so, between one and 200 cases that haven't engaged at present. Uh, and we're, as Cliff, uh, telephoning, lettering, uh, door knocking, uh, trying to get that final application from them. Carla, you want to do Yep, um, we weren't one of the organisations Jimmy mentioned, but we have said that so far the measures taken to mitigate against welfare reform are very welcome. Um, but we've highlighted in our submission the importance to look beyond welfare, or beyond mitigation now. And we need to think about how we can stop people finding themselves in this situation. And while the Scottish Government have had many successes, the Scottish Welfare Fund, I think, overall has worked very well. Last year, for the first year in over a decade, Scotland's seen child poverty figures rising. So while there have been successes, we have to be very aware of the fact that we need to tackle this problem, especially before we completely reverse the trends of falling child poverty. Um, David, do you want to follow up? Uh, I had highlighted that as well. I, mean, I just wonder if Carla can see what that means, though, in practice. You know, it, it's well and good to say, you know, look beyond mitigation, but, but what does that mean on a practical level? Bearing in mind we are the Welfare Reform Committee as well. No, I, I appreciate that, obviously, you're the Welfare Reform Committee. From our point of view in the budget, what it means on a practical level is early intervention. It means helping children while they're still in school to break that intergenerational cycle of poverty. And it means trying to get to people before they're in that case where they are unable to feed themselves and where they're going to food banks and things like that. What that means on a practical level exactly for the Scottish Government, I'm not sure. I mean, Mr Cook has just spoken there of uh, the efforts of North Latch Council, a council that I don't always praise, I should say, I'm sure Mr Cook's aware of that, um, to actually reach out to people on a proactive basis, so there is some evidence of that, isn't there? I think there definitely is, and I think with discretionary housing payments, I know the other people in the room will know this much better than me, but from what we have heard, I know at the start there had been problems with people who thought um, the bedroom tax had been abolished, for example, mm. they'd read papers and thought they don't need to do anything about this, but I know the local authorities and housing associations actually were very good in targeting the people who needed to apply for the DHPs to make sure that actually they didn't miss out. And I think that was an example of being proactive in early engagement, which worked really well in helping people at an early stage. Um, Keith and then Jeremy. Uh, just to pick up on the points on, on moving past uh, mitigation, uh, I think the Scottish Government have done absolutely the right thing in, in mitigating. I think local authorities have done very well in making sure that happens on the ground. Uh, but moving on, um, I think we need to look at empowering the individuals that are affected, not just uh, protecting them. 
Um, so making individuals and communities more resilient to the impact of changes, because um, the Scottish Government can't mitigate everything that happens. Um, so you have to ensure that the people affected are able to, to help themselves, if you like. Uh, and particularly on that point, um, universal credit is probably the biggest change in, in all of the welfare reform. And people are, are very much going to need to be financially literate uh, and digitally literate as well. So I think moving on, there's a, there's a case to be said that mitigating welfare reform will involve empowering people through making sure they have access to digital uh, to the internet are able to use it and also able to budget um, well as well cope with monthly payments so i suppose those are, are practical ways in which the scottish government could be looking to mitigate future reforms okay, Jerry? i was just going to say that um, as welcome as, as the mitigation measures are obviously as the report that the sheffield hallam did for your co uh, committee pointed out um, 1.6 billion has been taken from the scottish economy and you do have some people who have been hurt really hard. And I think um, the, mid the discretionary housing payment, um, they estimated that that knocked £35 off the effect on every working age adult. So it came down from 495 to £460 per working age adult in terms of, of the, loss, um, the losses. And obviously that's, that's a huge amount to, um, to compensate for, and particularly some of them very, very vulnerable people because it was particularly those, uh, I think it was incapacity benefits what, who were hit the hardest, something like uh, the average um, loss was about £3,500 for those affected. Okay. Anyone else have any comments? Jonathan? Um, just to add, um, you know, I think this is where we're really coming from uh, in terms of um, the discussion we're seeking with, with the Scottish Government. Um, is to talk much more um, strategically and holistically about um, the impacts um, of welfare reform, um, much of which potentially is still to come. And I think that's the, the, the bit that um, uh, raises the real uh, fear uh, amongst our members. Um, and I, th I think it is about, um, you know, as Carla and, and uh, Jeremy and, uh, have said, it is about um, you know, how you can really kind of help people cope and, and, and support people uh, in, in a different way. Um, you know, uh, and, and I think we need to have that kind of discussion. Um, you know, it doesn't, it isn't necessarily just about um, throw, throwing money at something. Um, you know, and, and, and one of the key things is that, that we don't just keep looking at bits in isolation here, that we, we do actually start to understand that um, these impacts cut across um, the individuals are experiencing you know, uh, a, a range of um, challenges um, as a result of the reforms um, and it's about how you, you, you get those people to be able to cope a lot better with that. Um, so that's a kind of discussion that we're looking for with the Scottish Government. Okay. Annabelle, you wanted to ask a yes, question? Sorry, Good morning. Um, just a couple of points. Um, uh, uh, to continue with the discussion we're having, um, and we're looking at you know issues beyond mitigation. Obviously, we have going on in parallel the, the Smith Commission, and I, I note um, that it was in terms of the Alaho uh, written submission to the committee this morning um, that, um, and I quote. Um, so indeed would agree with what appears to be an emerging consensus, namely that as an optimum, welfare functions should be wholly devolved to Scotland under the post-referendum settlement currently being considered by the Smith Commission, uh, and then the, the caveat subject to a reasonable financial settlement, this would appear to present the best means of ensuring that Scottish citizens retain a humane and acceptable standard of living in difficult times. Uh, I'm looking at Marianne because she's the representative here today from Alaco, but it would be interesting also to hear from uh, others as well, because we are saying beyond mitigation, well, I think this is a very pertinent element of that uh, discussion, but perhaps uh, Convener Marianne would like to comment. Yes, I, th I think um, at the moment that's linked to um, the Smith Commission and what the outcome of that might be um, on any recommendations that come from that, but certainly um, in 
you know, the, the advent of universal credit has just been announced that the first tranche will roll out in Scotland and certainly North, Air, North Ayrshire and North Lanarkshire um, are in that first tranche which will be moving to universal credit, um, albeit to a small caseload and the impact on councils that that will have, particularly landlord rental income and the, the impact it will have on in, in individuals and also the work on the local authorities in implementing that in the short term if there were to be some other proposal regarding uh, welfare for Scotland. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that um, uh, SFHA also had some comments in their written submission about the uh, Smith Commission process. Yes, I mean, I, mean, I think... Um, Certainly, we, you cannot see, um, I think, a housing benefit, which, we, which is the thing that's, that's been, if you like, thrown up as, as possibly the, the most likely candidate for devolution um, should stand in isolation that, because of the complexity of, of lives and, and the interactions between the various agencies. It would make much more sense for, for a whole-scale uh, devolution of um, social security benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just say, convener, also uh, that COSLA, I think, had, had asked for the, the, along with the Scottish Government, for the halt of the rollout of universal credit. Perhaps the representative here today would like to say more about why they, they have called for that. Um, <clears throat> well, we haven't, we haven't called for that. What, what we've um, uh, put uh, or posited to our, uh, or will be positing um, to our leaders is that... Um, Obviously, Smith is, is doing the work that he's, he's doing and will be uh, producing a, a heads of agreement. Um, all we would like to do is to have a look at um, what, what actually comes out of that heads of agreement and um, you know, what it's actually going to say about detail and, and, and proposals. And, and I think it's only right that we, you know, being aware that um, universal credit is now set to... Um, roll out to a, a, a further extent in, in Scotland, um, as well as uh, a question that we had already had about the, the single fraud uh, investigation service, which is um, being uh, uh, rolled out in, in parallel, um, that we would um, look to see whether that, that, that was a question we wanted to, to ask back to, to the UK government uh, with the support of the Scottish government. Uh, as to whether we wanted um, in Scotland for things just to be put in, in, in abeyance and, until um, you know, further developments in terms of the, 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 the Smith um, recommendations uh, could, could um, be, be taken forward. Yeah, I, I mean, sorry, I didn't mean to, to uh, misquote uh, what the written submission says. So it was that, that COSLA have asked DWP to delay universal credit rollout in Scotland until the Smith Commission has reported conclusions. Um, can I also just briefly raise another issue on the issue of the council tax reduction scheme because it is relevant here particularly uh, when we're looking at universal credit. And certainly a concern that has been raised is the um, issue of DWP data sharing and, and the likely costs involved if that doesn't happen. Can I ask where, where that matter stands as far as, as people here to, today are aware and why is it that this would not be the optimum solution for the DWP to share the data? Maria? There, there was a recent um, consultation paper from the UK government on data protection from um, and a number of landlords have commented back on that and what they would like to see around data protection between um, local authorities and the DWP and the outcome of that consultation is still awaited. Mm -hmm. And do, do you feel that there, there's likely to be progress here? Because obviously there seems to be a concern that there will be very significant cost implications if uh, a sensible approach is not agreed by the DWP. Yeah, you know, I would like to think that there will be progress made on that in relation to data sharing, you know, if, if the rollout of universal credit um, is, is to, to work properly, then there needs to be um, data sharing between um, local authorities and the DWP, as there exists at the moment between landlords and local authority housing benefit services. We would be um, advocating for similar, similar levels of um, data sharing with the DWP. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm mindful that 
We're here to scrutinise the Scottish Government's budget for 2015-16, so while a lot of these uh, issues are, are relevant um, and interesting, um, the implications for the 2015-16 budget in any of these issues is, is more important. So the rollout of universal credit, while it's you know the, the technicalities around it, do people have concerns about their local authority budgets or in general about the impact on the current Scottish budget? I was going to come to you in a minute, Kevin. Do you want to get into that area at the moment? Or? Well, I mean, I was wanting to stick specifically to the budget. I was going to talk about um, uh, Cosler's submission here. Uh, they've basically talked about 2015-16, and they say the Scottish Government is again providing funding at the same level as 2014-15. This is welcome. But they then go on to say that they want assurance that any change to the level of DWP funding would be taken account of by the Scottish Government once it is known in order that the bedroom tax is fully mitigated. I mean, I'm just wondering, does the COSLA therefore uh, believe that the Scottish Government should meet any funding gap if the DWP do not uh, provide that £50 million? And basically, where, where should that money come from? <coughs> Jonathan? I had already uh, provided the answer to that, which is that um, clearly if, if there was some variation in, in um, what uh, DWP um, are going to be um, making available, then we would um, expect to have a discussion with the Scottish Government about how that impacts on um, the, the funding that they're providing. Um, the policy is to fully mitigate the bedroom tax, so um, that, that's the policy we would expect um, still to be in place, regardless of the actual level of funding that the, the DWP provides. So um, we would just, as I said, we, we, we just need to monitor to see what it is that DWP come out with. Um, the Scottish Government appear to have assumptions uh, around that, so um, they don't seem uh, to be too discomforted, um, but we, we need to see what it is that DWP actually um, uh, announce, um, uh, I think, uh, in the next month or so. So the discussions really would just involve the Scottish Government saying we'll come up with a £15 million effectively, you would suggest, if uh, DWP uh, pull the rug out? Um, I wouldn't expect DWP um, to pull the rug. I mean, they, w they will provide um, a level of um, funding. Um, clearly, that level of funding um, uh, was um, substantially higher um, for 2014-15 than it had been for, for previous years. Um, I think the assumptions, as I understand it, from the Scottish Government are that a similar level is, is likely to uh, be announced for 2015-16. Uh, um, as it will be the Chancellor's autumn statement that will um, kick, kick that uh, piece of information off. Um, so we just really need to wait for that. Okay, and in terms of the budget, um, you said you said in your submission also we need to ask what it is we can do collectively within our powers to address the pressures that welfare reform is bringing in Scotland. So um, what should this mean in budgetary terms? Um, I, I mean, I, th I think that's... That, that is the point, is that, um, you know, it's the discussion we've had um, just, just earlier that um, it isn't necessarily about picking out specific amounts of money and saying we need to financially um, provide for that. I think it's about actually sitting down and saying, you know, understanding more about what the scale of the problem that we think is going to be coming and then what about you know how, how we can actually bring um, forces together really to to be able to uh, address that um, more more effectively the um, potentially within that there may need to be uh, discussions about resource but at this stage um, that's not the discussion that's on the table the discussions on the table is um, around things like should Scottish Government be doing, um, working with us to do um, more kind of research, working with uh, uh, other agencies to, to, to get a feel for, you know, um, we've had the, the mention of the Sheffield Hallam um, uh, uh, kind of report that was done, but that was a little while back. So, you know, it's, it's really about what's the lay of the land now and, and uh, all of these different um, uh, issues that uh, individuals are experiencing, anything from benefit sanctions to the rollout of uh, DLA to, to PIP, 
I think we need to look at these in the round, and that's, that's what we're really saying to the Scottish Government. Now, you've talked about a strategic approach, convener, um, uh, and uh, you've mentioned the Sheffield Hallam University uh, study, and of course, uh, Jeremy touched on that as well. And I mean, it's £480 a year for every adult of working age, but uh, Glasgow may expect to lose £650 in one area of North Ayrshire, £560 per person. You, it would cause be suggesting that additional resources should specifically be allocated to these more deprived areas in order to uh, mitigate some of these kind of uh, losses specifically? Uh, I, well, as I say, I, I don't think it's really about um, a mitigation per se now. I think it's about something a little bit um, beyond that. Yes, um, clearly where um, you know, we've got areas of um, you know, deprivation um, it's likely that these um, issues are going to manifest themselves, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, across the piece. So I think, you know, uh, I appreciate it's a bit vague uh, in terms of giving you the answer here, but we, what, what we're trying to get over is, is, is that the mitigations that we have and, and that are continuing, um, these are all welcome. And, and, you know, we, we do think that they're appropriate, and that's it's, it's in terms of the 15-16 budget, that, that is meeting, um, you know, what we would have expected. Um, but we need to start this discussion now uh, about how we get to a better understanding of um, the, the impacts um, that individuals are experiencing, and then how we as the agencies um, are able to um, come together um, in a different way, really, to, to kind of support people. And, and yes, as I say, there, there may be something about um, discussing, you know, resources uh, around that. But, I, you know, it isn't about saying that there's, I don't know, you know, so many pound per head coming out uh, from uh, individual communities. That's the, yes, that's the impact. But the, the point is, well, what's the intervention that we can do at least to kind of support um, people in terms of experiencing that impact, because we're not going to be able to necessarily uh, mitigate that scale of, uh, of impact going forward. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, Ken McIntosh. Just um, very much the same theme, both uh, Cosla and North Lanarkshire both, and I think other contributions both, talked about the increasing demand on council services, I think, uh, Cosla talked about the increasing demand on the Social Welfare Fund uh, and North Lanarkshire talked about dependence on council assistance generally likely to increase. The SWF, has, has there been a... a, a do the figures show a big demand in uh, SWF applications across the board and local authorities? So that's Jonathan Sharma. Um, the most recent figures that I've seen um, are not necessarily uh, manifesting in that way. I mean, I believe um, that, um, obviously... First of all, the Scottish Government has actually put, um, you know, had put additional funds in, into the Scottish Welfare Fund. Um, at the moment, um, you know, I think some of these issues are ones that are still to, to, to come about, and that, that's what we're, 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 we're most worried about. So um, looking at it, I think broadly um, the spend is, is, is not a million miles off. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm happy to take... Uh, individual councils' thoughts here as well, but that's our understanding in terms of the information that the Scottish Government is gathering uh, about the, the, the Scottish yes, Welfare yeah. Fund. They, they monitor it quite closely. I don't know if you ask, no, no. To, to Sorry. Run on that point, yes. so before you... uh, just on the point in terms of demand for the Scottish Welfare Fund, I mean, um, Glasgow's experience is that we are seeing a big increase in demand, but it, it's hard at this point, I think, to assess whether that's just simply... Uh, I would say 2013-14 was the first year of the Scottish Welfare Fund and it's difficult to draw, I think, accurate comparisons. Um, but certainly our current experience is that we're only able to award high-priority cases and our acceptance rates at the moment are at 60%, so that's 40% of applications that we're currently having to turn away and we don't necessarily see that situation uh, changing any. We, would, we may be able to award to medium priority for a couple of months, but we expect we'll need to change that back to high in order to come within budget at the end of the year. Mm. Brian? In uh, response to what said uh, in the Scottish Welfare Fund, uh, we will certainly be turning away in 
similar to Morag for Glasgow. Uh, we are at high, and uh, it might even be a category within high, where it's high plus. I can't remember the exact phraseology for it. Uh, but we're having to manage from now to the end of this financial year that budget uh, with the expectation that in order to keep money there for forthcoming crisis grants, uh, then our community care grants uh, are really reaching the very highest ceiling before we can, we'll actually consider uh, awarding those. There's an awful lot of unmet demand there. We also uh, see, in, uh, as Morag said, last year's stats are uh, in our own fund. Uh, took a bit of time for the probably awareness of the fund to bed in across our, our uh, council area. Uh, so the April to June, June to uh, September stats last year were relatively small. Uh, but in the, the first quarter of this financial year, uh, I think we account for about uh, 15 to 20 per cent of the applications across Scotland. Uh, and the distribution of the money for the Scottish Welfare Fund across Scotland, uh, we're, we're suggesting, needs to be considered where the demand is and can we target funds to there from the existing budget and probably look for 15, 16. Is there any scope to expand that existing budget? Uh, the other side, certainly from uh, a point raised uh, earlier on, but the resources within the authority. Uh, we are, again, as an authority, having to spend, similar to everybody else, money towards the council tax reduction scheme uh, that we agreed with the Scottish Government to jointly fund. Uh, we are seeing, and I think uh, Alatra had mentioned, uh, the increase in the inquiries uh, that are coming through authorities uh, because of welfare changes. Uh, a great increase in advice and financial support being sought from us across a range of areas. Uh, and those are just going to continue uh, apace, particularly when uh, universal credit rolls out in the first tranche for us, uh, starting in sort of February through to April next year. Uh, we expect that to uh, not dramatically increase because, as uh, Marion had indicated, probably a little small caseload at the, uh, the inception of that. Uh, but if it does... Uh, incrementally increase, uh, then those cases are going to present again at our door for advice, support and assistance. Just, just, I'm just wondering how much evidence is there of it happening yet? I mean, uh, if you take um, the council tax scheme and the bedroom tax, they're very uh, discreet, rather they're fully funded, mitigated schemes. Um, and clearly North Lancashire have had a lot of application under those schemes, but have you, have you noticed already uh, a, a increasing demand on local authorities just for advice, for assistance generally, uh, on, on the basis that as welfare is cut back, the, the, I think the likelihood or the expectation is that people will turn to local authorities first and foremost. Is there evidence that this is happening right now or is it just an apprehension that's about to happen as we move to universal credit and other schemes? No, I think I can say I don't have the stats with me for it, but I know our first stop shop uh, where the, the public come in to make those inquiries. Uh, there is an increased footfall there. Uh, from I can get the statistics and uh, uh, provide them from across there. And I would suspect, uh, I can't say authoritatively, but I think equally on our advice services side of it, uh, money advice, income advice, etc., uh, there will be a, an increased demand there. Again, I could uh, source the statistics and provide them. Uh, just on advice, um, as part of the Scottish, <coughs> budget, um, the Scottish Government has funded uh, the Sc Scottish CAB service uh, to provide mitigation advice. Uh, in the last 12 months, that's allowed uh, 17,500 clients to be helped with nearly 55,000 new issues, which is capacity we wouldn't have had unless we'd had that money from the Scottish Government. So that's really helped us to mitigate the worst impacts um, for those clients. Uh, clients in this project have much more complex and time-consuming cases. Um, they had an average number of three issues, whereas the average bureau client has two, so they have that one extra additional complex issue. Uh, and for every one pound given in grants through the project, seven pounds was gains uh, for the clients. That's about client financial gain of seven million pounds. So I think mitigation funding for the bureau for advice uh, has worked uh, in that sense. Uh, and we'd like, um, I think the, the funding runs out in March 2015. Um, so obviously we're arguing that actually this is working, uh, and also that um, some of the worst is still to come in terms of 
personal independence payment and universal credit. Uh, so we've seen that, that additional footfall, if you like, and because of the mitigation funding, we've been able to meet it so far. Uh, and just going back to the, the previous question on crisis, we've definitely seen an increase number of clients in crisis or destitution, people that can't afford to put food on the table. Uh, and we're broadly encouraged by the way the Scottish Welfare Fund has been operating in the last year. Um, but there does seem to be a gap. Um, it doesn't seem to match up the Scottish Welfare Fund seeing increased people are having a, an underspend at the same time as there's an increased number of people needing food parcels. Um, so we're trying to, to marry the two, see what the reasons are why people either can't access the Scottish Welfare Fund or, or aren't accessing. Sometimes it's because they have an immediate need, I need food right now. Or, or sometimes it's uh, that uh, the Scottish Welfare Fund, they know it can't come within two days, if you like, and they can't wait that long. So I think there's, there's probably research or work to be done to make sure that that gap's narrowed to actually make sure the Scottish Welfare Fund can deal with those crisis situations rather than people having to go to um, food banks. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin. Oh, sorry, Ken, you not finished? Yeah, yeah just a, a, a slightly separate issue, uh, perhaps with uh, Keith Driver first and also Carla McCormick. Um, one of the um, submissions he had um, uh, talked about issues of, of um, gender inequality uh, and also about child poverty. In other words, if you, if you look at where the, the biggest uh, impact of the welfare reforms are going to be, um, women are disproportionately affected and, as has been... And the, and the Scottish Government's own figures, um, uh, its own analysis suggests that child poverty is going to rise markedly. But the, the way that welfare spending from the Scottish Government is being allocated tends to be um, on policy-specific issues or on departmental lines. In other words, we've got a council tax reduction, we've got the bedroom tax mitigation, we've got advice support. But we haven't actually got gender... I mean, it's, it's not being spent on gender equality... I wonder if, if either would like to comment just about whether there should be more to address those bigger themes. Uh, I think it's a, a, an interesting question. Um, we know under universal credit there's the concern that there'll be one single direct payment to households, uh, whereas uh, under current provisions the child benefit, child tax credit can go to one account, could be the mothers for example, and there is Scottish Government analysis that shows that actually that could be a concern in terms of family income, child, um, spending on, on children, uh, if it is to a single account, because women often act as a, a buffer um, and mitigate changes on their own on family households. So there's a concern that that will impact on, on gender equality. And you're absolutely right to say that child poverty has for the first time in, increased um, in the last couple of years. So I think there is a case for looking in more detail uh, at those two specific groups. Uh, just ask, uh, the, the quote, this is from the, the, the document convener from Engender Scottish Women's Aid and Close the Gap in Scottish Refugee Council. Uh, one, one quote, uh, to give you an example. The Scottish Government's own analysis recognises the extent of women's disadvantage and its link with child poverty, but spending plans do not take either set of issues into account. No, Carl, you'd like to comment? Um, we would certainly support Engender's calls for the recommendations they've put forward to the Welfare Reform Committee. Um, we know that most of the money that's come out of, that's impacted on people's pockets has come out of women's pockets, and child poverty is obviously generally a result of adult poverty. So the realistic situation is if you're a lone single mother and you're living in poverty, then those children are going to grow up in poverty. So really, it is about thinking about how we can tackle that issue. It's one of the things that Poverty Alliance had called for on the Smith Commission was the ability for Scotland to create its own benefit. Um, and we had thought that we could use that to bring back things like loan parent grants, which would enable us to help single parents, um, particularly single mothers, to avoid getting into that situation where we have women directly being affected by poverty and therefore their children growing up in poverty also. Mm. And we, we, does housing, I was wondering just on that issue about being an SADG as well, again, the, the, uh, as well as gender inequality and, and child poverty, uh, fuel poverty and housing um, poverty seems to be one of the huge issues that's emerging or rising. I wonder, Jeremy, if you would comment on whether there should be more done here in Scotland, given that a lot of, a lot of the powers in housing are, are entirely devolved. Well, um, the powers in housing, I mean, one, one of the things we pointed out is um, the growing housing benefit bill 
means that there is actually an imbalance and, and the amount of money that, if you like, the Scottish Government has for housing is um, becoming proportionately less um, because of the rising housing benefit bill and the fact that um, the investment that the Scottish Government may be making in, in housing in terms of, of more affordable housing, fuel efficient housing, um, you know, the, the, if, if you like, the benefits are being derived, um, you know, are, are not being cascaded down to the, um, the, the right people. Um, I think, um, I, I mean, we have um, a lot of concerns, particularly with, with regard to um, the universal credit rollout, and, and you were saying about the, the single payment to households. Um, that's of a deep concern, and it seems, um, despite representations that SFHA has made and, and uh, other organisations have made in, in the various liaison groups, it seems to be something that the, uh, the DWP uh, seems to be comfortable with. Uh, even to the extent that um, on some of the universal credit rollout um, schemes, um, the housing costs have been awarded to the member of the household who isn't actually the tenant. It may be a, a person who's moved in with the tenant, and therefore that creates um, a lot of legal niceties as well should, uh, um, in terms of arrears recovery. Okay, Kevin. Um, thank you, convener. And we have... Uh, Heard today that 1.6 billion, according to Sheffield Hallam, will be come out of the Scottish economy. Two billion, uh, if you look at others, uh, and we have uh, a budget of mitigation of 104.22 million um, in the next financial year. Um, and I think everybody round the table recognises that while that mitigation is welcome it's not going to stop the worst excesses of welfare reform. Now, we've heard um, today um, from some folk um, round about uh, a strategic view uh, of what we need to do to counter the worst excesses and spend the mitigation monies in the best way possible. Um, but I haven't really heard very much um, from COSLA in particular about what that strategic review actually involves. And before I come to Mr Sharma, could I ask the local authority representatives what their local councils have done to ensure that there's an interlinkage between all of the services that you are providing, um, those that are most in need? Because we've heard um, about a lack of signposting convener um, in terms of the Scottish Welfare Fund. Uh, we've heard about a, a lack of information sharing between social work departments um, and uh, revenue and benefits folk about the Scottish Welfare Fund. We've heard that there's possibly duplication between um, some of the social, social security, uh, sorry, social work emergency payments and the Scottish Welfare Fund. And I think, you know, with the small amounts of mitigation monies that we have in terms of the giant cut. Are we working smart at local authority level to ensure that we get the most bangs for our buck? And I'll start with Mr. Q. Uh, yeah, well, I think, yes, we are endeavouring within the local authority to do that. We have, uh, <laughs> internally, we've provided a fund of about £2 million from the council to help towards welfare reform changes. Uh, and that's been funding uh, advisors in our financial services side of it. It's funding the, uh, the, sh the contribution we need to make to the council tax reduction scheme. Uh, we are endeavouring uh, between ourselves and housing who look after the, uh, the council house tenants and the needs that they have out of welfare reform to work and try and prioritise monies that are uh, allocated there. Uh, so that our welfare fund, Scottish Welfare Fund, will look to see whether there's been a, a DHP application and will refer there. We'll also make reference to our advice services. Uh, in addition, our uh, housing revenue account uh, has created a, uh, a separate fund uh, to help tenants who are in arrears uh, and having difficulty uh, arising from the welfare reforms. Uh, could I say we've done absolutely everything? There will be ones that continue to fall through the net. I think it's not dissimilar to the, uh, the stats from uh, the study. Uh, 
where there are uh, £2 billion pounds being taken out of the Scottish economy. And we've got funding of £142, uh, £22 million, around about £1 in £20. Pounds. Uh, there will be households that clearly are not being helped. There will be uh, circumstances that are not being met there. I, I noticed that you didn't really mention social work in that answer there in terms of discretionary pay payments that they can make. The social work side of it, my board, our financial advisors, the income side, uh, they work in our, our social work sector. Uh, so when they are uh, assessing incomes of households and endeavouring to uh, source more money, they will make claims for additional benefits that are fair them. Uh, but they also, uh, as you suggest, make awards of those grants. And again, we try and ensure that if they're unable to access Scottish Welfare Fund, DHP, uh, what we've called the Sustainability Fund from the, the HRA side of it, and the, the social work grants where they're appropriate. Mr Dryborough. Yeah, uh, certainly in the City of Edinburgh, it starts with member officer uh, working groups with representatives from all the, the various areas that you've uh, mentioned. That, that leads to reports going to the various uh, council committees on a bi-monthly basis. Uh, giving updates and recommendations on what the Council can uh, try to do to mitigate the, uh, the effects of welfare reform. That flows down to individual areas like myself, who look after uh, benefit processing, the Scottish Welfare Fund and CTR. So, uh, you know, there are linkages across the various areas. We have separate uh, forums with our housing associations where we specifically talk in some detail about all the aspects that we're talking about here today. Um, but I would echo some of the, the comments that Brian's making. The levels of funding uh, the local authority has put in are mainly to help administer the monies that have been provided. And that might be uh, the fact that in my submission, I mentioned that we don't have enough administration grant there uh, to better 15 days for a community care grant or two days for a crisis grant. Uh, that the level of DHP funding, while it's absolutely welcomed, has meant that we have gone from around 400 DHP applications in 2012-13 to something like 5,500 applications in 14-15. Now, that is a huge... About social work... Is there an interlinkage with social work? As I asked in the, in Mr. the Scottish Pate. Welfare Fund. In this question in the Scottish Government's draft budget 2015-16. Uh, 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 abso absolutely there is, because you know, it's making sure that that £104.4 million pounds that is going to local authorities um, can do its possible best. And if there, if there is duplication um, in some areas and a lack of interlinking between um, each of the, the, the council departments, then you know that money could go further. Um, and the reality is, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish off finally with Mr Sharma, and I'll get to my, my point that I want to make about all of this. So social work, yeah. Yeah, there, there are very close links between our welfare fund and social work because I mean, clearly within the scheme, um, people can and do come back time after time and, and maybe always don't need to because their, their needs could be met more directly. And that's when we communicate with social work, we arrange home visits, we look at people's needs, for instance, just as an example, to try and make sure the resources are used in the best way. And uh, I wonder if Ms Johnson uh, wants to pick up on that too, please. In Glasgow, probably at the end of 2012, the Council set up a corporate welfare reform uh, working group and took um, representatives from across the Council, including uh, social work, education services. We have representatives um, from registered social landlords and links um, in there as well. And when we actually set up that group, we tried to, to look at what uh, the changes to welfare reform meant and identify a number of different work streams. I think we ended up identifying about 20 different areas that we felt that we needed to look at. Now, some of them were very directly linked to the actual changes coming in. So we had one for Scottish Welfare Fund, etc. Um, but we also had a look at some of the wider implications. So we have a work stream for things like digital inclusion, for financial 
inclusion. We have representatives from our arm's length organisation, Jobs and Business Glasgow, who um, help people try and help people back into the jobs market. We have an area that looks at economic growth and what, what we're trying to do in the city to improve um, labour uh, demand as well. And we also have a communication strategy that sits across all of that to recognise that um, the, the communication and engagement with citizens and also the advice sector it, it is very important across all of this area. So that's the way that um, Glasgow has tried to address it. In terms of specific questions, we actually have a, a member of social work on the Scottish Welfare Fund steering group that we manage, and they link in around the section 12 and 10, 22 payments, and we have a, a process for that. Thank you. I don't know if Ms McManus is able to answer this in terms of her speciality or no. It's, it's similar to the other authorities, the cross-service um, working group within the council looking at uh, different work streams. But in addition, um, as um, the North Ayrshire Council is the biggest landlord in uh, North Ayrshire, a decision was taken early on given that a high proportion of tenants would be the ones affected um, by welfare reform um, to put in place at a cost of over 400,000 a welfare reform advice team specifically to provide advice and assistance um, for council tenants and to work with other services, particularly social services, um, in providing that support. And that has been particularly successful, particularly around um, discretionary housing payments. And I think we're down about, we're about 20 people who've still got applications to get for discretionary housing payments for the bedroom tax. And we work very closely with our colleagues in social services around applications for the welfare fund and also with um, a number of our community planning partners in the third sector and how we can work more closely with them to deliver better services. Thank you. Uh, and for Mr Sharmer, in, in the COSLA paper, um, it said uh, that the Scottish Government should take a st strategic approach. And I'll come back to points about that in a second. What is COSLA doing to ensure that best practice, the strategic approach, if you like, um, is being exported uh, across our local authorities? What work have you been doing to ensure that best practice uh, is being fed out everywhere? Um, <clears throat> well, in, I think specifically in regard to the Scottish Welfare Fund, um, uh, we um, are actively engaged uh, in terms of um, how we um, kind of share um, kind of best practice and, 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 and uh, knowledge um, locally. So um, there is um, my colleague, Nicola Dickey, who actually does... Um, go out uh, to uh, all of the local authorities and and uh, um, the various officers that are taking forward the, the Scottish Welfare Fund. So I think you know, and and in in terms of her work, I think it, it is about trying to make the the linkages as as well to to make sure that there is the crossover. Um, I think. You know, our impression of the Scottish Welfare Fund is it's something that obviously um, has come, you know, as, as a um, effectively as a Whitehall kind of um, centrally delivered uh, support, which at the end of the day was, was not really hugely, um, you know, kind of hitting the, 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 the kind of target uh, audience, if you like. So I think what what we're getting from uh, the feedback from our, um, uh, you know, from the people in the in the councils coming back, um, is that we we have much more of a holistic service that's being provided now. It's it's quite different from the service that was there before, albeit it does you know follow uh, uh, quite a number of the, uh, the, the 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 key strands of that. But it um, it is a different service, and I think that's what we feel is the thing that we, we need to capture um, uh, is, is the, you know, councils do have a huge amount of experience and, and knowledge in, in dealing with uh, individuals that, that, that come to them. Um, and that is something that... For Sharma, because uh, uh, it was quite an easy question in terms of that exporting. Um, and you're going in, I, 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 I mean, you're going into some detail that I haven't really asked about and not really telling me very much. Can I ask you about the exporting of best practice and what's 
COSLA has done to help in that regard. We've heard from, from Ms Dickey previously at the committee. Can you give us some examples of where you have helped feed best practice across the country in order that each council manages to get the most bangs for its buck? Um, well, I, I, I think I have um, given you the answer in terms of the Scottish Welfare Fund. As I say, my colleague um, Nicola Dickey can provide um, much more detail in terms of that if that's what the committee would like to see, although my understanding is that you, know, you do um, have um, uh, sessions where you've, you've asked my colleague to come. I'm actually here to, to question whether COSLA is delivering uh, best practice. That, that might be for your other committee, Kevin. What Can we're trying to do is establish the, the Scottish Government's budget is it going to uh, meet the, the demands? How best can we meet the demands? You know where I'm going with this. If uh, we can stick to the budget, we might uh, okay. actually have uh, a, a, a more uh, constructive dialogue between yourself and Mr Sharma. I think I am trying to stick to the budget to ensure that the <coughs> Scottish Government's money, as spent by, by COSLA, um, is getting as much as it possibly can. But I shall, I shall move on, convener, and my final question um, is round about that strategic... Um, approach um, that is mentioned uh, in the COSLA paper. Um, and I'd really like to, to know, and Mr Gibson tried in his questioning, what does COSLA mean by a strategic approach in terms of providing um, a budget that's required to deal with that? And beyond that, maybe Mr Sharma can tell us how they have been, been dealing with the DWP in terms of trying to ensure that they give more um, so that that adds to the mitigation budget that the Scottish Government has put forward. Okay. Um, I think, first of all, um, this is about um, working in partnership um, with the Scottish Government. Um, and a key part of that is um, our joint lobbying um, with... Um, uh, you know, with the UK government, and um, I would say that that has been, um, you know, a, a positive experience in terms of um, the willingness uh, of, of Scottish government to, to engage with us in turn. So we have um, put forward a number of um, different lobbying um, strategies around that, particularly around um, things like protecting the. Um, the, uh, the funding uh, which comes from the UK government uh, already for uh, a number of strands, um, the, the Housing um, Benefit uh, Administration Grant uh, being, being a key one of those. What I would say is, um, and, and, and I thought I had said it, which is, um, I think, think was echoed by, by um, co uh, the colleagues around the table, is that um, mitigations, uh, all, all, although they are welcome, uh, and um, in terms of the 15-16 budget, um, we, we feel that they're, 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 they're appropriate and the, the, the right things that have been uh, called for. There, there is an emerging um, issue around uh, the impacts of welfare reform, many of which are still to, to, to happen. And what we need to do is to um, you know, get a dialogue um, which recognises the whole spectrum uh, of, of changes that are happening here and impacts that are happening here. Um, I think there probably needs to be some more research work that, that we do. Uh, I mentioned that um, that was something that um, we, we, we could do. Um, I, th I think you know, the joint lobbying needs to continue. Um, advice and support was an area that we identified. Um, so I, th I think that one, as I was trying to say just in my previous response was that um, the councils are doing a lot of work around that so so it's understanding what that work is and, and bringing that together I think is very important um, also employability got mentioned um, is there something more holistic um, that we can do in terms of how we approach the employability agenda um, you know, uh, at the moment, um, my understanding is that things are um, a little bit um, disjointed in terms of, of, of how we uh, approach that ac across the piece. So it's about looking again at, uh, at some of these things. Uh, I think that's what we're calling for in terms of the dialogue. Um, and that's as really as specific as I can be. 
Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have any comments that they want to make specifically on the budget in terms of pressures that they might foresee and, and where issues that they'd like the committee to take up with the minister to, um, to see if there's additional uh, funding or support that we could uh, investigate? Ken, you want to make a point? The local government representatives in particular, they, um, we're obviously concentrating and our committee does this, concentrates on, the, on um, welfare specific budgets. But given that there's an increased demand on local authorities, and the local authority budget is probably the one that's been big, uh, the biggest squeeze in the budget decisions, uh, are you finding, you know, given that you're going through a, a series of difficult decisions, uh, reducing um, or trying to meet rising demand in terms of care and uh, community care, demand for elderly services and so on, and reconfiguring things, uh, is there something more can be done about the local authority budget generally? as opposed to welfare-specific budgets. Questions were out of scope. Surely that's well out of scope. I think asking about whether local government budgets out of the Scottish government budget is within the, the remit of the budget. Mm. Um, I mean, to suggest that Kevin's question was wide and then that's, you know, yeah. we'd have one rule that applies to everybody, but it's a fair yeah. well, question we're, we're in general terms. To, you know? Can I just point out to members, we're here to scrutinise the Scottish government's budget, not to scrutinise COSLA or local authorities. That's yeah. absolutely right. So... Yeah. Um, if anyone wants to comment on Ken's question, I, I, or will we just leave it at that and call a halt to the proceedings before we... Could possibly come in, but, um, it was a, a wee supplementary to an issue that was raised earlier. It's just really a technical point, if I may, yeah. uh, on the issue of bedroom tax arrears in the previous financial year. And I just wonder, um, ha has there been a, an assessment across the piece of those arrears across the 32 councils in terms of actually attributing them to bedroom tax arrears as opposed to other arrears. I just wonder if that work has already been carried out or if it's in process or... Pardon me? Well, I'm just asking the question as to whether it has been embarked upon as yeah, a that piece of work because asked. people refer to this as a, a fact but without actually quantifying yeah. what the, the figures are. So I thought it would be helpful to know what work has been done to try to quantify that. Thank you. Does anyone want to have a, a go answer on that question? Yep. Um, in North Irish Council, we are undertaking an exercise on that at the moment, but I think in the actual paper, West Lothian had done some work around that. I think they had estimated about 365,000 outstanding for them in relation to 13-14 uh, bedroom <laughs> tax um, arrears. It is a manual exercise. It is quite difficult uh, with the system as people come on and off during a year, go into employment and then come off employment, what periods. So it is quite a labour intensive for staff to come to that figure, and, but we're certainly in North Ayrshire trying to um, quantify that at the moment. Okay. Yeah, just Brian? Uh, I could, uh, uh, in, Brian, by turning it on its head, say, on our experiences of 1415 and how much DHP we've spent, um, you know, mitigating the effect in 1415. And as has been mentioned earlier about the funding not being available to fully mitigate our years for 1314, we could certainly estimate what that cost to DHP would have been by mirroring the 1415 spent. Mm -hmm. And certainly in Edinburgh, I know we would have needed on our estimate, about an extra 1.8 million if we were to go right back to the 1st of April 2013. Yeah, Brian, you wanted to make a question? Yeah, and we'd done a, uh, a lot of work between our housing systems and our uh, revenue systems uh, with the software supplier. And that's why I think earlier I'd mentioned that we have just over 1,100 cases uh, with about £475,000 of arrears uh, coming from uh, the 13 14. Uh, legacy areas side of it. Uh, as Marion said, prior to doing that, it was a, a manual exercise uh, and would probably be prohibitive uh, the, over that length of time for all 32 authorities. So the, the work we had to do with the software guys was to get that to uh, very commas be available to push a button. But uh, if there's an IT guy here, I know it wasn't just a push of a button. It was slightly more complicated than that. Well, that's, that's interesting, and I, I guess we'll look to see more uh, information on that very issue. But I guess if, if it's the council policy to seek to recover arrears, you would need to kind of know as a matter of law what you're seeking to recover as a debt. I, I, just, I just can't quite understand how, on the one hand, you would need that legal certainty, but on the other hand, we don't seem to have that information as yet. But it, as you say, Marianne, your council is working on that. And on an individual basis, on accounts, officers dealing with, they, do know, they would know how much of um, 
arrears are attributed to um, the bedroom tax, 1314, um, but to bring that across the board um, does take some time to, to do that bit of work. Okay. Well, I think that's has exhausted the, the questions that we're going to get this morning. So thanks to everyone for the contributions. I appreciate you giving up your time to come and inform us on the Scottish Government's budgets and other questions that were asked as well. Um, I'll suspend the committee until 12 o'clock when the Minister will be in front of us, but thanks again to everyone. Thank you.
Going back to their places, uh, the committee will now hear evidence from Margaret Burgess, the Minister for Housing and Welfare, Jenny Brough, Team Leader, Local Government Finance and Local <laughs> Taxation Unit, and Adam Reid, Team Leader, Welfare Division of the Scottish Government. Minister, do you have an opening statement? That we I'll say a few words, uh, Convener. Thank we'll take you. From there. Thank you. Okay. I welcome the opportunity to address the committee on the 2015-16 the draft budget. It sets out how we will focus our tax spending and borrowing plans to achieve three primary objectives, to make Scotland a more prosperous country, to tackle inequality and protect and reform public services. It also sets out our commitments that are designed to tackle poverty that continues to blight society. The Committee is well aware that the UK Government's welfare reforms continue to cause concern to a great many people and organisations across Scotland. And the Scottish Government's priority is to mitigate the most harmful effects of the UK Government's welfare reforms as part of our wider efforts to tackle inequality. In 2014-15, we allocated £81 million to do this, and we have maintained this level of funding in the 2015-16 draft budget. This funding will maintain investment in the Scottish Welfare Fund, assist councils to support all people by affected by the bedroom tax, and invest in a range of third sector initiatives for income maximisation and tackle poverty, particularly in support of our new child poverty strategy published earlier this year. The 2015-16 draft budget also includes a range of other measures which will support our welfare mitigation activity, including additional investment in housing with over £200 million uh, additional being allocated for housing, rolling forward our contribution of £23 million to fill the cut in funding from the UK Government for Council Tax Benefit successor arrangements and delivering the £9.4 million People and Communities Fund for 2015-16, which has a refreshed focus on the promotion of so social inclusion, tackling poverty, including welfare the mitigation of welfare reform. And to deliver these, we're working in partnership with a range of organisations, including third sector, local authorities and others. And this collaborative approach will go some way to meet the challenges imposed on us by the UK government. The continued investment we're making of over £100 million when council tax reduction scheme is included can only go so far in mitigating the worst impacts of the reforms. The scale of the cuts is immense and we are constrained by the powers and resources that we have. With full powers over welfare, we could do much more to fully protect our people and tackle the inequalities that persist in Scotland. Greater coherence across our tackling poverty agenda through better alignment across childcare, child benefit and other measures to tackle child poverty are possible with full wel powers over welfare. Um, I'm happy now to take any questions the committee has, convener. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Can I open up with a, a, a question? We, we were taking evidence before uh, in our first panel, and we received a written uh, contribution from Engender, Scottish Women's Aid, Close the Gap, and the Scottish Refugee Council. And in that, they, they obviously concur with you in respect of the increase that, that's projected in child poverty uh, because of, of the welfare reforms, and we know how damaging uh, those reforms are being. Um, they are obviously paying attention to the fact that that child poverty will, will come about largely because of reduced incomes in particular to women. But in their analysis, they concluded that the spending plans that they've looked at from the Scottish Government's analysis do not take either set of issues into account. How would you respond to that criticism? I think in terms of the, the welfare reform mitigation, <coughs> we, we certainly have uh, looked in some of the, the funding that has gone out from the uh, Scottish Legal Aid Board funding and the Money Advice uh, Making Advice Work Project. Uh, some of that funding has been targeted specifically at women's groups and um, for such as in Perth Women's Aid, uh, for one, and the Eastern Bartonshire, people that have suffered from domestic abuse, eh, recognising that the majority of those are women. We've also looked in terms of a guidance for the Scottish Welfare Fund to ensure that lone parents, again, the majority are women, women are um, a priority in that, and we're monitoring that closely to ensure that eh, women are not left out in terms of any of the funding that goes from the Scottish Welfare Fund. So we, we are... Um, 
monitoring that, targeting that, but all of the, 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 the mitigation money that we have put out is, is benefiting women as well. Um, it's not specifically a pot of money targeted at, at women. Um, it's targeted at the full welfare reform mitigation. We also fund uh, from our, our budget One Parent Family Scotland, Child Poverty Action Group. Again, many of them, those organisations concentrate on, on women. So we are looking at that. And in the wider agenda, in terms of increased childcare, um, looking at the living wage, all of those will, will help um, women and help reduce poverty within women and children. Okay, I'll open up to the committee members. I'll go first to the Deputy Convener, Jenny. Thanks very much, uh, Convener. Um, we have had uh, some concern expressed by cause we heard it earlier today about uh, the, uh, the lack of clarity uh, thus far from the DWP about the element of DHP funding they will be providing for uh, the, the coming year. That obviously has a, an impact on, on the government's uh, budget potentially. Or, can you set out, or is the Scottish Government any clearer as to what the DWP might be allocating for this coming year? Do we know yet? No, we don't have that information, and we also have concerns about that. Uh, we share the concerns of COSLA in a number of the, uh, issues uh, regarding the DWP, not just in the rollout of universal credit, but obviously our discretionary housing payment budget is based on the, the, the amount of money that um, we get from the DWP for that. In terms of some of the other things at DWP, um, Council Tax Reduction Scheme, in terms of how that funding, we've been very clear that when the DWP put a burden on to um, Scotland or Scotland's local authorities, then they should be funding that. And we have said that at every opportunity and will continue to do so. And I think there's letters going signed between COSLA and the government to that effect. And that was going to be my follow-up question, so you are actively pursuing this with the DWP then? We are pursuing it and we'll continue to pursue it. OK, thank, thank you. And uh, another uh, issue that was provided to us uh, in relation to uh, DHPs uh, was uh, from Alacho. They said without the additional funding that the Scottish Government had put in place, uh, council rent, rent arrears would, could have been up to £49 million by the end of 2013. 14. Just wondering, if, does that match your assessment in terms of the, the positive in, impact of yeah. the, the money that you've leveraged into DHPs? Well, well absolutely, um, and, and that's the purpose of it, to ensure. Clearly, we want to be ensure that nobody is in rent arrears, arrears because of the bedroom tax and solely because of the bedroom tax and take that part out of the, the arrears story. So, yes, that does match what we're saying and with the feedback we're getting from both local authorities and housing associations is that the mitigation funding for discretionary housing payments has um, helped them reduce the rent arrears or the anticipated rent arrears that they saw because of the bedroom tax. It's not happening now. And, and certainly, um, you know, that's been welcomed across the, across the board. Okay, thank you. That's, that's all just do. Okay, well, uh, Kenneth. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, Minister, um, we had uh, some considerable discussions with COSLA in the previous session of, um, regarding their submission, and one of their uh, points that they raised was the issue of um, what they call... Um, a lack of a strategic approach, or what they're basically saying is, if not a lack of a strategic approach, they're suggesting in their paper, and I quote, that there a far greater strategic approach is needed with Scottish Government to look at welfare reform impacts on the ground, regardless of what changes are forthcoming. So I'm just wondering what's being done to take that forward. I mean, that's something that we've been looking at since the very beginning of welfare reform. The Government was very clear that the bedroom tax... Um, was the start of it, and there was a lot more coming down the road. And um, we've done work, uh, as you'll be aware, on disability benefits and the impact that's going to have in, in vulnerable groups in Scotland. So we are looking at that, and we're looking at across the board. We've asked the UK government to halt the rollout of universal credit. We've asked the UK government to halt the rollout of personal independence payment as well. Um, we have to wait and see what we don't know what we're going to get from the Smith Commission and how far ahead we can look. But we have worked with COSLA, with the third sector, um, with Scottish Government analysts to look at the full impact of welfare reform, not just the, the, the uh, bedroom tax, but everything else that's been introduced by the UK and the further austerity measures. 
and that has been looked at. And I think it's very clear in the budget throughout, taken taken out even the welfare reform mitigation funding, that the budget as as put together by the finance secretary is very much looking at tackling inequalities and maintaining public services and reforming public services, as well as making Scotland a more prosperous country. So there is a, a approach right across uh, the whole budget in terms of reducing inequalities and poverty. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, convener, I wonder if I could just pick up on um, the area the convener started on, which is that clearly the, um, uh, the Scottish Government has... Uh, supply the resources to meet specific needs in terms of council tax reduction and uh, the bedroom tax mitigation scheme. Does the Minister recognise, however, that um, poverty itself um, is increasing across the board, you know, particularly women are experiencing increased poverty and children? And does the Minister think that the government is doing enough across the board, rather than, um, rather than funding specific initiatives, that maybe that it might be better to do more to alleviate poverty across the board, not just um, alleviate or mitigate Westminster changes, but to do more in Scotland here. I think uh, that that's what was trying to make the point to, to, to Kenneth Gibson, that the budget across the board is looking at reducing inequalities, and that's inequalities between uh, in poverty, narrowing the gap between those that have and those that haven't. And in every portfolio, that, that is part of what has been looked at, how can we reduce these inequalities? Because that, that is the whole focus of the budget, is reducing inequalities. So I do think that that, we're constant, that has been concentrated on this budget. I think we've looked at it in terms of what's happening uh, with childcare. I think that's uh, and what's happening in terms of the, the living wage, the Scottish Government's position in promotion of the living wage and funding organisations to encourage other businesses and companies to, to um, take up the living wage because it's absolutely uh, crucial to, to improving people's chances and life chances. What we're doing in our, our child poverty strategy in terms of the early um, early years and uh, inter early intervention, what we're doing in terms of that, all of that is about reducing inequalities in, within Scotland yeah. and, and that's the whole focus of the budget. Okay, maybe if we just talk about it in terms of, of local authorities specifically, um, I think several of the witnesses earlier were talking about how, and in the written evidence, were saying that um, the first port of call for many people experiencing poverty will be their local authorities. And yet, local authorities themselves would suggest that their budget is both being uh, directed by the Scottish Government towards specific areas, the bedroom tax and council tax reduction being one of them, squeezed overall, um, and particularly with the fact that they have not got the ability to raise the council tax, they've got no discretion themselves to increase the amount they might want to mitigate. Do you think the government's got its approach right there to local government? I think the local government, I think £10.6 billion pounds was local government. Um, what they received last year and this year they're receiving £10.8 billion. Pounds. Local government have done well and I think the President of COSLA has said that himself, that given these um, difficult times and financial constraints that the Scottish Government is under, that local government have done well. Um, so I do think that we have been fair to local government and in terms of the, the bedroom tax and the council tax reduction scheme, that wasn't something that was imposed on local authorities, um, but the mitigation by the Scottish Government. It was done working alongside local authorities and their partners, uh, listening to them, and, and, and we came together to see the, the solution for that was to, to mitigate, and that's where the funding went, as uh, in the council tax reduction scheme, which local authorities uh, contribute £17 million to. Um, but also some of what's happening in the preventative approach as well, which local authorities are using the preventative approach, the Scottish Government is using the pre preventative approach, and in some instances um, there will be shared, expen shared expenditure because what one department is spending, another one can be saving in that. So, you know, local authorities have a part to play in it as well uh, as the Scottish Government. So I do think uh, local government funding has been fair. Um, and I think that's been recognised uh, by the President of COSLA. You think that local authorities have done well, therefore they shouldn't be complaining that they haven't got enough money to tackle poverty? 
I didn't say that they sh shouldn't be complaining. What I said is I think given the constraints of the Scottish Government, the financial constraints that we're under, and that local authorities uh, have done well out of it in terms of we maintained their uh, 10.6 billion, we've increased it to 10.8 billion uh, for 15-16. So I'm saying they've done well given the constraints that we're under. And you're under financial constraint. Why are you putting the financial constraint of council tax freeze on local authorities? That, that is something that all uh, parties in this parliament supported. It's fully funded by the Scottish Government. We fund the council tax freeze and that they've been given the money to make up for the anticipated increase. It's helping families across Scotland uh, knowing that they're not going to get a hike in their council tax at times when they're struggling as well. Can I just ask you about housing? One of the submissions from the Poverty Alliance particularly uh, talked about the importance of um, housing on poverty and suggested that it's doubtful that the level of budget, that's the Scottish Government's level of budget, will be sufficient to meet the statutory duty to end fuel poverty. We therefore urge the Government to carry out a full review of how it can fulfil its commitment to eradicate fuel poverty in Scotland. What would you make of, in response to that? I think request? eradicating fuel poverty, given the increases in um, electricity uh, for fuel, is a challenge. We've never said it's not a challenge. But we are putting in £79 million pounds, uh, of money, which is more than has been put in, by, in both in real terms and in cash terms by any previous administration. We are putting into fuel poverty and energy efficiency measures. We have managed with that to bring in money from the uh, eco-obligation and the energy companies to spend over £220 million pounds in fuel poverty measures. We would like to... Um, we have asked the Smith Commission for to have powers over the regulation of energy efficiency and fuel uh, energy efficiency and eco measures, and also that off them is as accountable to Scottish ministers as well as UK ministers. And in doing that, um, we can then really target resources more effectively to suit uh, some of the issues that we face in Scotland in rural communities that face fuel poverty. But we're certainly putting in more than any other uh, country within these islands in terms of our commitment to fuel poverty. So do I take it from that that you will meet your commitment to eradicate fuel poverty by the end of 2016? Our intention is to eradicate fuel poverty as, as far as practical by 2016, and that's what we're aiming towards. All right. Do you think you're on target to do so? It's a, as I said, Ella, it's a challenge. It's a challenge because of things that are out with our powers, out with uh, external sources in terms of um, the energy companies and their price hikes. Also, the UK just recently changing uh, the eco um, conditions in terms for eco, reducing it so the companies, energy companies are not themselves now putting so much money in to match the funding that we're putting in. So it is a challenge, but we're committed to it, and we're committed to putting public money into it, and that's what we're doing. Can I just check, though, do you think, are you on target? I mean, are the figures increasing? The numbers of people in fuel poverty, are they increasing or are they decreasing? The, the number of people in fuel poverty is decreasing. The households in fuel poverty, um, had we not put the measures in, 600,000 households, one in four households in Scotland have benefited from energy efficiency measures. And had we not put that in, I think we've got, off the top of my head, I can write the committee with the figures because I didn't realise it was part of the discussion today, is 74,000 more households would be in fuel poverty had we not put uh, the measures in place that we've put in place. Indeed, but the, just to give you the estimates here, this is from the Poverty Alliance again. Um, the Scottish House Conditions Survey showed that in 2012 there were 647,000 647, Scottish fuel poor households. That's 27.1 per cent of households. Energy Action Scotland estimate today it's 900,000 households. How does that... The, the figures... Working the right we are working to the figures that we, we use, which are the Scottish Quality Housing Standards, and the, the figures um, which we believe are the robust figures. We know that the Energy Action have uh, used other figures. We don't have the, the background for the figures that they've used. We are absolutely accepting there's far too many households in Scotland in fuel poverty just now, and that's why we're continuing to put in Scottish Government money. We've also 
um, used any, we've used financial uh, transactional consequentials that have come from the UK as well, put that in in terms of our green homes cash back. We've used that as well. So it's not just the £79 million. There's other measures throughout the budget in the energy budget that we're taking to reduce fuel poverty and energy efficiency in the homes in Scotland. But that will be sufficient to, to lead to lift more than half a million homes out of fuel poverty by 2016, well, as is the government's promise. What I, what I can say is that we are absolutely committed to spending money in fuel poverty, which is more uh, money than has been spent by any administration in this parliament, both in real terms and in cash terms. We'll continue to do that. We'll look at every method possible to lever in more money mm -hmm. from the energy companies. We have written to Ed Davey uh, with our concerns about uh, what, uh, the way the UK government has gone around uh, changing the, the rules to the eco-scheme to say that that is not going to benefit Scotland and we want them to take that into account. So we're doing everything we can. We've asked the Smith Commission uh, to say that something we think is a priority to have um, power over regulation uh, of energy efficiency and also that Ofgem is accountable to, to ministers in Scotland as well. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, Kevin Stewart. Thank you. Convener, um, in terms of uh, this year's budget scrutiny, the Finance Committee adopted four principles of scrutiny, uh, one of which is value for money uh, and the extent to which public bodies are spending their allocation well and achieving outcomes. Can I ask, Minister, um, obviously there is some very good practice going on in terms of um, the Scottish Welfare Fund uh, in certain councils, not so good practice um, in others. How is the government ensuring that best practice is exported throughout the country uh, to ensure that the maximum amount of money possible goes to helping vulnerable people? Okay, well, I think I mentioned that the last time I came to the committee, the Scottish Government funds uh, an officer in COSLA, a Scottish Welfare Fund officer, uh, which we fund uh, in COSLA, and, and their role is to go around all the, the local authorities, the Scottish Welfare Fund teams, um, look at best practice, look at the guidance, the whole practitioner meetings, and it is about getting that best practice out there. So that is ongoing, and that will continue to be ongoing. Uh, and I think I did mention before that I also have visited a number of Scottish Welfare Fund teams, spoke to those in the front line, to look at issues that they find are difficult, pass on some of the, the uh, good practice that's coming from other areas, and that will carry on. We're also looking at the guidance, and we we'll put the, the scheme in a statutory <laughs> footing to ensure that the guidance is, is fit for purpose, absolutely right, everybody knows it and understands it, and that we do get that kind of level of consistency that we're looking for. But there will always be a bit of flexibility for local authorities in, in their area, because... They, they best know their area, but certainly we need to get that consistency. Can I ask if that officer is also looking at the interlinking of budgets within um, councils and not necessarily the social welfare fund, but social security, uh, social work, handing out payments and all of this? Are they ensuring that again there's that linkage to make sure that we we ensure that the most vulnerable are, are getting what's required and that there's no duplication? Or is that part of their remit to look at that too? That, off the, the top of my head, I, I don't know if that's part of the remit. We can certainly look at that. But what I do in, in expect is that that officer does look a bit forming relationships with other departments of local authorities, um, with housing departments, with social work departments, um, but just in what detail they do it in, I don't know, and it's certainly something that I'm willing to, to take back and get back to you on. Convener, if I can change tack just a little bit. Obviously, one of the things that the committee has looked at previously um, is passported uh, benefits um, and ensuring um, that folk were not losing out uh, to a huge degree because of, of reforms to, to DLA, um, for example, uh, and also uh, making sure that the free school meal provision here um, was as fair as it possibly could can be. Um, are you still looking at the impacts of welfare reform uh, in terms of the UK government's agenda on that passported benefit issue? 
Yes, we are looking at the impact of welfare reform across the board, and that's been looked at. Some of it's been slower because the rollout of PIP has been slower um, that, than we anticipated. We've now asked the UK government to halt it, but we will be following that through and looking over the piece, the, the, the total impact of reforms on an individual or a family. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, Convener. Annabelle. And good afternoon, Minister. Um, just a few points. Um, I, I guess in terms of the discussion that we've had in the previous session and, and, and this session, we maybe get a bit sort of um, blasé about what the Scottish Government is doing in terms of mitigation and what we're looking at in terms of our budget scrutiny is uh, the budget lines of the Scottish Welfare Fund, discretionary housing payments and council tax reduction. And indeed, um, perhaps that... Um, is put into focus by comments from the submission from the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations where they say at paragraph 6 that um, within the scope of powers currently devolved to the Scottish Government has managed to implement three mitigation initiatives that colleagues confronted by welfare reform in England and Wales would dearly love to have. So I, I just wonder, Minister, if you could um, explain the, the reasons why the Scottish Government has proceeded with these three mitigation measures, because I think it's always important to go back to first principles. This is something we're doing here in Scotland that's not happening across the piece in the UK, and uh, uh, it would be interesting to hear the, the fundamental motivation for proceeding with this approach at this time. Okay. Well, absolutely. I uh, absolutely agree. We are doing something uh, for people here in Scotland that's not happening in other parts of the UK. Um, and obviously, the, the reason behind it was when we very clearly, these were measures put onto Scotland that we would not have had this Parliament, had the powers, would not have passed uh, these measures. And it was very clear that the people who were going to be impacted most were those most vulnerable in, in society. And I think the Parliament as a whole and the government uh, as well, and I think that the Deputy First Minister, uh, I recollect her saying we couldn't stand by and see people being uh, damaged in that way and, and see uh, the harm that's putting a, wreaking right across Scotland. So I think it was about uh, stepping in when we saw that those in poverty uh, and those the poorest in society were even going to be further disadvantaged by measures that we did not support and this parliament didn't support. And, and that's the reasons behind, it. in some ways it could be said we were reacting, but we were reacting, but in a positive way uh, to something that was out of our control. And I think it was important we did that, and I think it was right to do it. And I think that, you know, across Civic Scotland and in local authorities uh, and across the majority of the Parliament, we all accept it was the right thing to do. Thank you, Minister. Can I ask specifically on the issue of the council tax reduction scheme? It was a question I asked in a previous session. Um, some of the submissions make reference to um, the potential extra costs that will be involved if there's not adequate data sharing uh, on the part of the DWP. And I just wonder uh, exactly where we are with that, because that seems to be, um, to my mind, um, I'm not entirely sure why they feel that they can make any uh, conditions or, or restrictions on the access of local authorities to much needed data that will help them reduce, reduce costs. I mean, we, we well understand it. I may ask Jenny to say a bit more on this. We well understand uh, why the local authorities want the data, the data sharing, and we very much support that. And we're in discussion uh, with the, the UK government about that. And I don't know if you want to say any more. Or, um, yes, um, it might be helpful um, if I clarify the arrangements that are in place at the moment, um, because I believe, having read the submissions, that the concerns were being expressed around the rollout of universal credit and what would happen with data sharing there. So at the moment, prior to the abolition of the council tax benefit last year, the UK government and the Scottish government worked together to put regulations in place which would maintain the sharing of data as existed under council tax benefit and exists for housing benefit with local authorities. And they can use that data with the UK government's permission to assess entitlement for council tax reduction. Now that's for the legacy benefits that are in place at the moment. When universal credit rolls out, there will, of course, be a need that the Scottish Government has represented to the UK Government on a number of occasions for local authorities to be able to access universal credit data in order to determine entitlement to support for council tax reduction and a lot of other forms of support for those in receipt of universal credit. And that's a point on which we continue to uh, represent um, that very urgent need for our local authorities to have that data. And the DWP have established a programme of work to develop universal credit data sharing solutions. And we in COSLA participate in that programme. 
That's very helpful technical information. Perhaps it would be possible to ask the Minister to keep the committee updated as to how these discussions are uh, progressing. Will do. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Okay. Following on from uh, Annabelle's question about the use of existing powers, you said in your, your uh, opening comment that with uh, full power you could do more. But I'm reminded of evidence that was taken previously on the committee from uh, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, who pointed out, I think around about this time last year, it was certainly a report in 2013 called a review of devolved approaches to child poverty, that they had expressed concerns over the limited focus on reducing the attainment gap in schools and in skills training opportunities for adults with few or no qualifications. Just two examples that they say are among the long-term drivers of poverty reduction and are already devolved. The, the, the Joseph Rowntree report in 2013 concluded that existing powers and budgets have not been maximised from an anti-poverty perspective. So can you tell us in what way this budget addresses those concerns from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation of last year? I think um, across the budget, as I said earlier, it's one of the priorities. And I think the, the Deputy First Minister announced it as well, and we'll be getting the programme for government very shortly, um, that we have uh, an absolute commitment uh, to reduce inequalities. We're doing it with the, the powers that we have in terms of... Um, We've committed £300 million pounds over 2014-15 to 15-16 to uh, expand childcare provision. Um, we're, I spoke earlier about the, the living wage, what we're doing in the living wage. We've extended uh, free school meal eligibility. Um, so we're doing what we can uh, within existing powers. We've got other support. We've got the Enterprise Ready Fund, um, People and Communities Fund, the Early Years Change Fund. All of that is about reducing inequalities. The, the um, money we're spending in housing and, and affordable housing also works towards reducing inequalities, and that's what we'll continue to work towards. So I, I, I'm not quite sure if there's something specifically you're suggesting that we should be doing that we're not doing. I, I, I gave you two examples that the Joseph Rowntree Foundation had flagged up. Um, I just wondered if you could give us examples of... You know, strategies which in those areas of, of uh, increasing employment and improving educational standards which actually help people to get out of poverty. So um, that was the two well, examples that they had identified. Educational attainment is improving now in Scotland and I think that was announced uh, fairly recently that we're, we're doing that. We have the, the child poverty strategy which focuses on family income um, places, sustainable places uh, in communities for people and um, prosperity and giving every child the best possible start in life. So that, that's the start of our child uh, poverty strategy and that we're working towards that and we're measuring that and that's going to be measured, you know, against the, out we're going to measure the outcomes against uh, those criteria. So we are doing that. There's, it can always be said that w we can do more and we work with, uh, as I say, um, the Ministerial Advisory Group on Child Poverty that sits, uh, includes um, business in the community, includes all of the, the, the key players in child poverty, and we work together to arrive at that strategy. So that's not just the government strategy, that's the strategy from across the sector. Um, but we believe, believe we will be able to do more with more powers. Um, we've already um, increased childcare, we're looking at that, looking at um, how we can reduce these inequalities across the board and what we're doing in terms of the social wage uh, is helping people as well. That helps those in poverty uh, as well as those just uh, in an average income or middle income. Okay. Alex. Thank you very much, Convener. It's one of the key principles of the UK government's approach to uh, welfare uh, is to use welfare reform combined with economic measures to manage demand downwards. The Scottish Government has, of course, devoted quite a, a substantial uh, amount of money to mitigating uh, many of the UK Government's measures, which uh, are additional costs. Can the Minister tell me if there are any measures taken by the Scottish Government that she could describe as being designed to manage demand downwards? Um, 
Um, if you're suggest I mean, if you're saying, are we taking measures to get people off of um, people that are really struggling um, and take them off of, of their benefits. We're doing lots of things to encourage people into work, absolutely. Um, employability schemes, what we're doing in terms of modern apprenticeships, the use training money, all of that is about getting people into work. But what we're not prepared to do is sit back and allow people to suffer because through no fault of their own, because they have a disability, because they're unable to get work, because the UK schemes haven't assisted them to get work. And because of that, we're simply not going to just let them uh, wither on the vine. We're going to help those people at the same time supporting them into work. The absolute priority is about supporting people and supporting them into work. We've got limited powers on that just now, but when we, if, when we, if we get more powers than that, we'll be certainly supporting people into work. The overall result will, may be less people claiming benefit, but the <coughs> object of it is not to get people off benefit and save money. The object is to support people and allow them to fulfil their potential. If we look specifically at the issues surrounding the under-occupancy charge, for example, the Scottish Government have uh, devoted a significant amount of money to removing the economic pressures on those who are under-occupying uh, homes in Scotland. However, the policy on a UK-wide basis uh, has always been assumed to be one which, uh, when it bites, will uh, in fact change the way houses are occupied uh, and will only have a cost over a, uh, to uh, individuals over a limited period of time. The Scottish Government's actions have effectively preserved that cost indefinitely. So as the cost of implementing the under-occupancy charge in the rest of the UK reduces, that cost will continue uh, to be uh, an expense in Scotland. Does the Scottish Government recognise that it would be a, a fair assumption that as uh, costs reduce south of the border, the UK government might contribute less and you would have to contribute more to compensate for the fact that you have taken no equivalent measures to manage how our housing stock is occupied. Well, I mean, I, for, a, for a start, I, I would have to say that I don't think uh, the bedroom tax, um, the introduction of it, is, should be about managing housing stock. And I don't think the UK government should be managing the housing stock in Scotland. Housing is devolved in Scotland, and I think we manage our own housing stock. And we happen to believe it's right. This government, this parliament, almost all of Scotland, uh, absolutely found the bedroom tax as something unpalatable when they saw the impacts it has in families and people asking them to leave their community, move from their community, move to houses that were too small to move them back at a later stage uh, to, to, to a house of a similar size, the upheaval it has in families, the distress it was causing people. Now, this committee, uh, I know, had heard evidence from across Scotland of what was happening and the impact the bedroom tax was having on people. So I think, absolutely, we have done the right thing. We have done the right thing to mitigate the bedroom tax. We'd want to abolish the bedroom tax. Um, and, and I stick with that position, absolutely convinced it's the right thing to do. You, you have used the devolved powers, you've used them well, uh, you have accrued a cost, uh, surely then it's the Scottish Government, uh, the Scottish Government should accept the cost of its own policy decisions. The Scottish Government is paying the £35 million from our policy decision. Um, so I'm not quite sure where you're getting that there. What we're doing is protecting some of the poorest people in Scotland at the request of virtually every organisation in Scotland and the Parliament, almost across the board at this Parliament, there's, you know, the bedroom tax would never have been passed in a Scottish Parliament. So you're saying that the policy of uh, bringing down demand uh, is one that you simply don't support, that you accept that uh, the gov Scottish Government has done the right thing across the board in ensuring that there were no demand reduction measures implemented in Scotland? I think the Scottish Government has done absolutely the right thing in terms of welfare mitigation when we see the harm it was having in our citizens. And at the same time, we're using the, the resources that we have to get people into employment, encourage employment, get people into to better paid jobs, promote the living wage, um, have a, a training scheme for 30,000 
people getting into training. Employment's higher in Scotland now than it has been in the past. But in the meantime, while doing all of that and wanting people into work, we want to see people uh, getting a, a route out of poverty. We want to uh, reduce inequalities. But while we're doing that, we're certainly not going to see uh, people uh, in the desperate circumstances they were in because of the bedroom tax and some of the other UK uh, welfare reforms that were simply about cutting a budget and not about the individuals concerned. Are you confident that in a time of economic growth, when unemployment is falling, when employment is rising, that you're not doing the wrong thing by actually increasing the level of welfare dependency in Scotland rather than reduce it? No, I see absolutely nothing with allowing people to remain in their home. Uh, and from there, they've got a better chance of getting a job when they've got a home that they're stable in and secure in. So I think what we are doing is the right thing. We are supporting people who can work to work. And for those that can't uh, or who have care needs or disabilities, we're making sure that they've got a quality of life and a good standard of living. I'm sure you would agree with me if I was to describe what you've just set out as being a significant divergence in policy in Scotland as compared with the rest of the United Kingdom. Well, I think that's, that's absolutely... <laughs> I mean... <laughs> We are different as part, in terms of our policy in this part of the United Kingdom. We don't agree with what they're doing in the United Kingdom. The Scottish Parliament disagrees with it. So we've taken action to, to mitigate the worst impacts of what they're doing. So given that we agree that there's been a significant divergence in policy, how are you going to fund that divergence in policy this year, next year and into the future? Well, I think as the finance... Uh, the Secretary has always said we, we can fund things up to the end of a spending review, but we make clear what our commitments are. Our funding its in the budget, it's clear, it's budgeted for, it will be paid for this year and next year. And we're putting, uh, we've removed the cap in the bedroom tax. I think that shows our commitment uh, about what we, we think of, uh, about the bedroom tax and discretionary housing payments as a way out of it. We'd rather abolish it altogether. And yes, it's budgeted for. Given the changes that are being discussed uh, uh, by the Smith Commission, uh, do you foresee any point in the future where your policy decisions will be limited by the amount of money you can raise from the Scottish taxpayer? I'm not going to, to, to look at speculate in what we can get or can't get from the Smith Commission. I, I'm here this morning to say that what we have budgeted for, we can afford. We can afford it this year, we can afford it next year, and we'll be looking at affording it into the foreseeable future. Um, and we will not let people of Scotland down by having the poorest and most vulnerable in society suffer because of policies put on somewhere else. We have to create our own direction and the way that we see that people should be treated and that's supporting those into work that can work, making sure they get a wage that they can live off, but also supporting those that can't work. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. Well, that seems to have exhausted the questions from the committee. Uh, Minister, thanks very much for your attendance and your uh, officials as well. Uh, thanks again. Before we go into private session, I'll just point out to, for the record that at our next meeting on December the 2nd, the committee expects to consider its draft reports on the Scottish Government draft budget 2015-16 and the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill at Stage 1. We also expect to consider our work programme and to return to our consideration of the discretionary housing payment limit on total expenditure revocation Scotland Order 2014. But with that, I'll close uh, going to, uh, private session again. Thank you. <laughs>